there's so many things that uh, made us to suspect that Matthew's life was in danger. Uh, he received death threats and uh, he was under surveillance, constant surveillance uh, by the security uh, police here, yeah? as well as he was being trailed. I mean, we had that um, feeling that he was being trailed wherever he, his car was seen. The government has shown the utmost patience. However, I cannot ignore the insistence of all responsible South Africans, especially of the majority of... My name is Nyameka Goniwe. I live in Cape Town and I work for the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation. My work connects me still to Cradock a small rural South African town where 16 years ago, my husband, Matthew, and three of his comrades were assassinated. At Craddock in the Eastern Cape, tens of thousands of people gathered today for the funeral of four community leaders who died last month in mysterious circumstances. The burials were those of Matthew Ganiwe, Fort Kalata, Sparrow Makonto, and Sikeli Mechlaouli. The four disappeared on June the 27th after leaving a UDF meeting in Port Elizabeth and their burnt and mutilated bodies were found four days later. Attending that funeral that day, uh, you know, what lifted my spirit was to see so many people that day. And I, I felt a sense of release and, and pride. And I think we need to, to, to go back to that story. That the leaders didn't die in vain, but uh, through their death, that marked the beginning of our own freedom. I was just an ordinary girl who was quite naive in many ways, and I was never politically minded and never read newspapers. And um, meeting Matthew and, and being welcome to be part of the family has uh, made me to grow uh, and, and lips and bounds. Uh, Matthew also pushed me to go to university. So that also contributed to my growth. And of course, I was a um, supporter of Matthew, and we shared the same convictions. And of course, I had to get used to the idea of him being away from home. And also, even if he is at home, he's preparing things and documents. I mean, you know, that space. Always, he, you you were conscious of the fact that you need to give uh, him some space to reflect about things and. And also the awareness of the burden that was uh, sitting on, on his shoulders as a, as a leader. He was a thinker and he was a, a strategist and he, he was a, a great theoretician. He was uh, regarded as the father figure of the township and uh, um, they were angered, of obviously, and outraged. Well, he was regarded as a troublemaker by the security forces. He was causing us endless problems. The assassination squad intercepted the credit of four around 10 p.m. on the night of June 27, 1985. Their intention was to destroy any evidence linking them to the crime. They had brought false number plates to disguise the fact that the bodies were those of Matthew and his friends. They then suggested that the killers had belonged to a rival political faction. The day Goniwe and all of them were killed, we never for a minute doubted that it wasn't the security police. I would like to see those people that have actually killed the Craddock Four to come forward and to say, we have killed them, and then 
it must be taken from there. And the chain of command or the channel of command must be followed up to the very top from where that instruction originated. Fearing exposure, the killers of the Credoc Four sought amnesty from the TRC, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The examination of uh, Colonel Snayman, Van Sale, Duplessis and others went along the lines. Who gave this order? They not only gave contradictory ev evidence, but the evidence was um, very improbable. And uh, we were able to argue successfully that uh, they uh, uh, did not uh, make full disclosure. Now, Mr. Taylor, it is my sad duty to tell you that you are deliberately committing perjury. I ask for leave to hand in, Mr. Chairman, a report made by the South African police in Port Elizabeth as Exhibit GG. Mr. Taylor, have a look at paragraph four. Sekelo Laouli, unbekent, unknown. If this is true, a pack of lies have been, has been told to this committee. We went through the process of uh, the amnesty hearings, which uh, went on for months and months, and uh, we were facing all the time the killers on the other side of, 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 of the hall. And each time I, s I look, I look at them true, and I, I was looking, uh, what's, what lies behind those hard faces and the facade? Um, is there a human being there? Is, is there somebody with emotions? But uh, each time I look, I, 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 I mean, for, s for some reason I couldn't find. I think most of the people that applied for amnesty did it because they feared that they may be prosecuted. Uh, some of them uh, said sorry. I think few of them meant it. Some of them uh, shed crocodile tears. To reconcile with them, I think the, the process could be given a chance, but only on the pretext that they tell the truth. If we do not know what happened, there is no chance that you could reconcile with them. Yeah. Didn't uh, they lose that chance? Of mm. They lost it. Mm. I do they not know whether they've got the chance now. If the many people who went through the process of TRC have managed to, to feel much more better after, after telling their own stories, Therefore, it is so essential for many people who fell out of that process to do the same. What does this concept of reconciliation mean to me, to, to, to us? What does forgiveness um, require of me? We need to create um, a space for people to start to to express their feelings and express their opinion and feel strong about how they feel. And this is the reason why, with the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation, I have begun a program called Community Healing. And I guess um, what uh, Community Healing is trying to address as well is, is for us to try, uh, to first try and reconcile with ourselves, yeah, as a community. We, we, we are very excited with the concept of the community healing mm. because some of the ills in our community we can always assert that uh, some of them come from our past who are reaping the fields of our past mm. and we have never dealt with these issues. The challenge um, has been that of, uh, to all of us, to find ways of trying to enable people to deal with their own past. 
uh, by coming up with this um, community healing project, it's an attempt to try and address this big issue of reconciliation. The Eastern Cape, that's where it all started. It actually started in Craddock. It was called in the military the Dinafani Revolution, you know, the axle of revolution around which everything turned. That was Craddock. That's where Goniwell originated from. He became a thorn in the flesh of uh, the security forces. There's no doubt about it. The government has decided to proclaim a state of emergency yeah. in the following <coughs> It became obvious, especially in the Eastern Cape, that the leadership was being eliminated. We interpreted it as an effort on the part of the state to intimidate whoever was going to step into the shoes of those young men. Most of the activists believe that we cannot be intimidated, certainly not by the assassination of our leaders. Mandela said this, now you want to freedom. Even though we never spoke about it openly, to say, I'm going to be killed one day in this kind of way, uh, it was there. But there were also um, pointers to the fact that Method could be killed in a violent way. And uh, there was a, a siege here, and Matthew's name would be shot at, uh, you know, on, on a loud hailer on a sort of hovering helicopter over Lingelichi. Even with my mother-in-law, you know, being so a mother in the family, you, uh, her intuition of trying to protect uh, you know, her son, and, and she expressed that a number of times, that isn't this going to be too dangerous as to cause you harm one day? And I'm, I'm fearful of us. The way Matthew used to handle that with his mother was, no, no, no. Everything that I do, I'm very open about it. I'm not engaged in any criminal activity. Wow. I'm doing what I think is good, and if it shouldn't cause me any harm. We're stopped. Mr. H. Fouchier of the security branch, he came over to our car and, you know, opened in a cowboy, uh, cowboy style the door and then grabbed hold of Medu, uh, with the scruff of, of his neck and, uh, you know, pointing a gun at him. You know, uttering, uh, you know, words like, I'll kill you, I'll kill you. There was a massive outcry when Lawrence Duplessis, a colonel with military intelligence, confirmed in 1994 that he had, under orders, written a signal that called for the permanent removal of Matthew Guniwe and Fort Kalata. During the inquest that followed, the security forces were for the first time implicated by real evidence. I think that Colonel Duplessis that sent the signal was part of that fiction that was created by the erstwhile regime that uh, murder was not murder if uh, you killed the enemy. When I wrote that signal and sent it off without really grasping what it meant, I think. And, and once they were killed, and I, and I said that during the in inquest too, and it was about 14 days later that they were killed, I thought, my good heavens, um, is this because of the signal that I sent? Then it struck me that um, if it had been 
because of the signal, then, you know, I'm involved in a terrible deed. He revealed uh, uh, that signal at the, at the most um, dangerous times. I mean, uh, at that time, that, that it, 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 he could have been killed yeah. by, by, yeah. His, by his colleagues. Lawrence was completely broken. He was, uh, he, he, he just caught himself in a situation whereby I thought he was going to regret for telling the truth. We also understand that he was ostracized and humiliated in court. And uh, though we couldn't say that, our sympathies, I'm, I'm sure he could sense that. We were sympathetic towards him. There is a tremendous amount of sympathy from my side. And I wish I hadn't been involved in it. I didn't know that he had a wife and children and uh, what his aspirations were. And I can only ask her to forgive me for that, you know. I mean, what um, I've lived with it since it's, um, since it's happened. I still remember it all, though I was young. And I also feel for the Conningway family. Yeah. But my dad did show remorse. He always used to tell me he would. He felt so bad of what has happened, and he wished he had never had any part of it. Of it. And he just wanted to get the whole thing over with, because it, it wasn't the last time in our lives, definitely not. was to stand on the platform and uh, mobilize the people. They can go to hell with their laws, I don't care. <laughs> and Gonio was appreciative of such a, a, a talent because he wasn't a, a fiery speaker as we were. So his vision was really always to try and work towards getting as many people involved as possible. At the time the signal was revealed, one of the people who reached out to Lawrence Duplessis was Kuster Jack, who gave Lawrence a job in his new business. Ironically, years earlier, it was Lawrence who succeeded in shutting down the business where Kuster was employed. Kuster survived repeated detention and torture for his role in promoting a successful community boycott in the okay. Eastern Cape. Some of the things that I did resulted in him losing his job. And as I say today, we, we well, I can say we're friends. Lawrence happened to also have skills which I didn't have as I was studying my business. And I told my friends, my comrades, some thought that it was a crazy idea on my part. Some said, okay, we support your judgment, but we are not sure about it. But at the end of the day, I am happy. I remember I grew up in Craddock. I went to school in Craddock. I've always been proud to be a, a son of Craddock. I remember as a young man that if you walk in the street, you walk straight. If a black guy approaches, he's got to get out of the way. Credoc still remains so divided. We're still living in these pockets, you know, a divided uh, community. And the divisions run even deeper as people's memory and their mindsets are not the same. And yet, 
For those who experienced the brutality of the security forces, it was the ability to see the funny side that helped the people to survive. Even if you were detained and tortured a little bit, when you come back with um, swollen <laughs> lips, <laughs> the first reaction of, of, me, <laughs> of the people before they ask you what happened there was just to laugh at you. There is a grand old lady somewhere in Middle Drift who does wonders, a spiritual healer, you know. So she said we must go there. And she has powers. She could pray that uh, the police should not raid us and so forth. I was not prepared to enter into the rituals of that place. But she persuaded us to go into the bath. So I made it a point that uh, chief who took us there should be the first from our group to go in. We went in there. We saw she had a bucket of water, poured it over somebody there. That time you're only wearing your bikini, and then she would pour a, a carton of milk on your head, and you are on your way using your towel to dry yourself. When I came out, she had already been outside. Now he was using the towel. But I noticed that he was standing on one foot. Now I didn't know what was the matter with this. So I came in. Whatever concoction that was mixed in that water, it reacts when it mixes with the air. And you should know that water had gone into my tender parts of my private parts. I was jumping like a child. <laughs> in the whole of my life, I've never suffered like that. <laughs> she gave us a ball, something like party, to smear at us so that the security could not read us. We did that smear it uh, behind our ears. And then all of a sudden, the police didn't come. And she said, you see, it's working. <laughs> and he came to me. I'm partly hoarse, my voice. Now I had a voice like a baritone. She said, you see, it's working. I said, no, it's the shock of that cold water that has changed my voice. It has nothing to do with healing me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> Huh? You'll remember the issue that robbed the whole of South Africa, the hoisting of the Soviet flag at the funeral. When I saw the flags were just strewn mm -hmm. at the back of the house. After the funeral? Long after the funeral. Mm. And I just thought, my goodness, these are the flags <laughs> which the police are looking for as evidence. And I just like, you know, I, I called uh, a few youngsters and I said, look, Pull this thing and put it in a bag and go. Young kids, go, go. Mm. And they disappeared <clears throat> with them. <laughs> Pamphlets had been distributed by the defense. The oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, to say that they are going to remove the, the troublemakers mm -hmm. from the township. Mm. And that is what made us scared. He asked me, Who are the troublemakers? I said, Obviously, it's us. <laughs> 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 Flags which never flew, flew high here, and that was a symbol of, of resistance. And it was a statement that from now onwards, there's nothing that you can do to turn things around. So for me, part of the he community healing is, is um, the healing of that memory. The struggle was used to groom people, to guide them, and it has enabled so many people to be leaders of today and yesterday. But it has also left a void. They probably thought that by removing me from the civic scene, they would uh, crush uh, the Credo Residents Association, which was a civic association uh, which had only started uh, about, uh, say, two months ago, and which had proved to be enjoying the support of the majority of the people in the township.
The killers of my husband were denied amnesty. This brings home to me that what is essential is the signals of humanity within those who killed our loved ones. I need to feel that they understand my suffering. I need some indication that they do feel at a deeper level. If I were confronted with this kind of humanity, I, as a vulnerable human being, would be obliged to explore the possibility of reconciliation.